Hey everyone, and thanks for joining me for a new Tenacious V's podcast episode. Every week, I grab some friends and some drinks, and we discuss some bodacious babes from history. This week, we are discussing the group of Onabugeisha, as well as four individual Onabugeisha. These women were highly trained elite soldiers in the feudal period of Japan, Their reign lasted over a thousand years, and they were pretty much equal to the samurai in every way. The Tomoe Gozen, one of the women we discuss, is actually considered the very first general of Japan ever, as well as a tactical genius. These women were truly a different class of fighter, and they were used as the last line of defense and kind of like a secret ghost mode warrior sometimes they were stealthy and just amazing they had incredible weaponry which we discuss in depth and i just can't wait for you guys to hear the rest of the story i do have to throw out that there are some violence warnings in this episode there is discussion of ceremonial suicide due to samurai being involved you know and wars and battles discussed so it's it's definitely a little bit more of a violent episode so just be aware of that but we hope those of you who choose to listen really love it Minasan konnichiwa, and welcome back to another Tenacious Bees podcast episode. This week we're going to be discussing Ona Bugeisha and four different women. Okay, so what's up? Japanese. Um, are, they, are they geishas? No. Because they're just in the name too. So we're going to be the only best way to that. So, geisha, the direct translation is like someone who makes art or something like that. And then um, Bugeisha is warrior, and then Ona is woman, so it's a female, female warrior. warrior. Yeah. Okay. And uh, but you said that we're talking about four different people. So we're going to be discussing just the general class of Ona Bugeisha, and then also four different women who were Ona Bugeisha. Okay. Cool. So. Yeah. And um, they're just cool. little snippets. It's not like whole life stories. We're getting. Could you? Uh, do, do you could you get us a little more information on one of them in the Bugeisha? Yeah. One of the Bugeisha. They we'll were there. in the Bushido class of feudal Japan, and they fought with the samurai, although they existed long before the samurai. So, like, before samurai was an actual class in society, there were only Bugeisha. Okay. Um, the Bushido class is, like, the warrior class, but it's also, like, part of the noble class of the feudal system of Japan. So they were highly educated women warriors and they were taught science, math, literature, and horseback riding, as well as tonto tonto jutsu, archery, and sword fighting. Um, They were trained to use weapons to defend their homes and villages from invasion or threat. And a big part of what they were there for is for um, protection when there was no men in the village. And okay, so, so that's why the tradition started so early, was like men would be away at war and they had to have somebody to protect the village, so they started training like specific women to do it. And it was usually the more like rebellious, like unruly women that kind of like didn't fit into the homemaker model, like they'd kind of just make them on a bugeisha. But they would be, but what would actually be probably very good for them because it'd be a lot more culture in the sense that they would learn like sword technique and mm-hmm. along with like all these other skills that came with their position um which is pretty cool because it's kind of like giving some discipline to some of these you know some of these women would rally yeah but it's like harnessing that and being like okay well we're gonna make you be like take that energy and make you a fighter yeah definitely then, put it towards something productive and helpful at least for everyone to yeah. give you something to structure like better that's structure <laughs> 
Yeah, it does help a lot of people. But that's yeah. that's very cool because it would be just a, a, a serious warrior, you know, like well, a. Well, yeah. yeah. And then, like, instead of being outcasted or shunned or like forced into a role that they didn't fit into or enjoy, like they got to actually live a pretty good life and like own like they were treated well. Like I said, they were part of the noble class of Japan. So. So that rebelliousness was in a sense like embraced and like kind of like utilized. Utilized, yeah, yeah. That's very really cool. So at this time in Japan it was feudal, like I said, but there was all sorts of clans that were kind of fighting for power and then there was also the imperial courts. So there's like a lot going on in charge of like leadership and who's who's in charge of what and everything. Um, so that's why, like, invasion was so common and the protection of the village needed to be so constant was because, like, th- there was threat at all times. Sure, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. competition for, like, land and things like that, definitely. Like, they're just trying to become a higher power, for sure. Yeah. So at, at a certain point, it was just kind of clan-based who had Onabugeisha and who didn't allow them or whatever, you know? But then there was a certain point in history where every clan was, like, open to having them, if not, like, already had them. So it's pretty cool. Like, so like a well-recognized position, like, at least. Yeah, Definitely, okay. yeah. Like, cool. they were warriors. They were equal to samurai. Their ranks were considered equal. They were, like, went to war together. Mm, very cool. Yeah. Very prestigious. So they had three main weapons. The naginata, which was a long, thin wooden shaft, which let, with a curved blade coming out of the end. Yeah, like a okay, katana, but if you added like a foot and a half long handle to it. I know exactly what you're talking about. Almost yeah. like the blade of a falcon. Um, yeah, totally. So the smaller, more balanced version for women was called the ko naginata, and they favored this sword and became famous for it because of the length and how lightweight and maneuverable it was in battle. So it gave them an advantage with their smaller statures. That's amazing. Yeah, and they had like massive reach with it. So they could like, even if somebody else was like way stronger or faster even. They could keep them at bay just yeah. with the distance that they would pull on for sure. Exactly, pull on, that's what it was called. They also used a kaiken, which is a double-edged blade up to 10 inches long. And it was used in more cramped fighting conditions and for their ritual suicide, which is not seppuku. It's, uh, they would slit their throats or drowning was another common way that they would kill themselves to get away from capture. So they didn't disembowel themselves with samurai? No. So, seppuku literally means stomach cut. Yep. So... But yeah. I imagine this was also the reason it was accepted was that uh, the whole thing behind uh, Sudoku uh, was that it was supposed to be uh, because you're not getting captured, it's an honorable yeah. death. And yeah. that was the similar thing for Die by uh, your own blade rather than the enemy. Than the enemy. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So this was their version. So they just slit their throats rather than disemboweling themselves. Okay. So, um, yeah. But this was also used in close quarters combat. So mm-hmm. it just didn't, it wasn't just ritual. It was actually had another function. It was yeah. Just... Samurai worked the same way they used on, what is it, the uh, wak- Wakazashi? Wakazashi. Wak- Wakazashi was there. Wakazashi. Their short, close quarters blade that was also used for seppuku. It's also called harakiri, and harakiri is reserved strictly for men. Like, just that word, it's literally the exact same thing as seppuku. Like, you kneel, disembowel yourself, and then someone else cuts your head off. Like, usually a captain or something okay. will cut your head off. Side. That's right. Yeah, yeah. It's like that. Yeah, it's not really yeah. Open it up. But yeah, so uh, they did the throat slitting rather than the disemboweling. And I even had my sister help me with this one. But yeah, we couldn't really find much. They didn't have, like, a specific word for it that we could find other than, like, just ritual suicide. Sure. And so, uh, yeah, I don't really have much on that, unfortunately. But then, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> definitely, that's something to check out. Um, but then uh, there was a, a third weapon. Now, I'm going to ask, was it a bow? Because that was something that you had mentioned mm-hmm. was part of their thing. So there's actually a little bit more about the Kaiken. Um, so like you said, it was used for actual combat as well. Okay. And Tanto Jutsu was their specific fighting martial art form, and it was a knife fighting form. So, so good with a knife. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So they had like a lot of use for that. Sword. 
yeah, little ten inch blade. Oh yeah. Um. But then also, so when a Onabu Geisha got married, she had to keep her kaiken on her all the time. Like. So that was like a ceremonial, ritualistic thing about it, right? Yeah, and I think it was to protect her from her husband because they generally married samurai. So I think it was a protection thing because they had they had to have it on them a hundred percent of the time, like sleeping, eating, God. sex, bathroom, everything. Goddamn. Yeah. So it was like, but only once they got married, like yeah. when they lived by themselves, they were allowed to ha- and like because they would live on their own and run their own estates and lands and stuff. Um, and they didn't have to have it on them all the time then. You had sex with a sword arm. Uh, leg strap. <laughs> so yeah, the third one was a bow and arrow. Oh, yeah. Nailed it. Um, they were actually really well known for using this like massive recurved bow and shooting it while riding a horse, which is super impressive. That is super impressive. Yeah, wow. and they were like huge, huge bows, like mounted archery. Mounted archery with and the bows were like taller than the horse from the ground. And they were shooting them while riding. So Mass that would not only give, you know, because of the bend in it, it would give them extra, like, longitudinal velocity, but because they were such long bows, the distance would also be a factor that it, they could probably shoot very far. Yeah. And probably with the curve, with the velocity that would be sent from the curve at that distance, it would help them even mount it to be more accurate with their shots when they found it. Because it's Probably. just going to be sent without the wind, with the yeah. missile just right through there. Yeah. Well, and just imagine the strength needed to, like, draw that. Draw that, draw that. Draw yeah. Strength. Oh, yeah. That's insane. Yeah, like a 50-pound pole on a recurve is pretty wild. And on yeah. a uh, galloping horse. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. Um, definitely crazy. With, with extremely impressive. That's fucking badass as fuck. Um, so like I said, they used the Tanto Jutsu, the knife fighting uh, martial art, and that is still used and taught today in Japan. So it's efficient as fuck. Mm-hmm. Because you guys can, you know, cut them out. Yeah. Them out <laughs> Last to the test of time. There you go. Yeah, so it's like the 200 uh, BCE, or BC. Like I said, they were equal to the samurai. They got trained the same way. Well, they got trained differently, but they got trained like... In, in the, the same, same manner. Like the same fashion in, in terms of like etiquette as well as combat as yeah. well as study. You would all think that they studied it. Yeah. Just kind of different. They just kind of studied different weapons sure. and different fighting techniques than the samurai did, but they did it in the same way and they were like trained the same to do the same duties. They had to like uphold the same uh, civility, if you were. Sure, sure. Definitely. Because they were also allowed land and everything, which is which a pretty big deal. Important at the time. Yeah. Extremely, yeah. Just to, yeah, to be respected to own land. But for so long, uh, land, uh, for a very long time, land was one of the biggest. You that know, was it. The like position of power. And yeah. Monetary, monetary value, and just yeah, um, you know, farmland and what have you. And, yeah. It still is, and land is still a status symbol. Yep. Almost anywhere yeah, you go. Sure that's, that's true. Totally fucking true. Uh, um, so they were able to be in such a high status position as women in this time. Because, like, when we think of Japan, especially as Westerners back in the day, it's always like women were subservient and calm. You know what I mean? But definitely. They have, well, they have that, like, uh, view, especially in the Western culture. We yeah. See that. And portrayed in, like, all our, like, media almost. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's because around 900 BCE is when the Onobu Geisha started and like became a tradition in villages and as protectors. Um, And then Japan didn't become patriarchal until 500 BCE. So they had like 400 years where they were already themselves and doing this thing, you know, and it was like working and effective and good for the villagers. Um, And then they became uh, Confucianist. So, like, the influence of Confucianism is what turned Japan patriarchal at that point. Okay. And they kept some of the matriarchal roots as far as, like, letting the Onobu Geisha own land and rule and lead men into battle and stuff like that. So, yeah. Very cool. So they were actually, like, the one exception to 
the societal role of women as like mothers and housekeepers. Okay. Uh, they rose to prominence and widespread acceptance due to one badass lady, Empress Jingju. Empress, all right. Yes. So in 200 CE, after her husband, Emperor Shuai, the 14th Emperor of Japan, was killed in a battle. She destroyed all the rebels responsible, like, super quick. Just, like, crushed them. And then she led a three-year conquest of a promised land, which was probably the Korean Peninsula. Um, and then when she returned, she became the acting empress as a regent for her son. And so, okay, so I have to state that this woman, like, may not have existed at all. Okay. Or she may have existed, like, 200 years later, or this may be made up or stretched. Like, okay, the next part I'm going to tell you is definitely made up, but, (laughs) but, like, everything about her could be made up, or it could be, like, a Ragnar Lothbrok situation where it's, like, multiple kings were kind of, like, idealized into one person, or we don't really know. Like, the records are super weird about this lady. So something remarkable happened. Before she left on her conquest, she was pregnant with Emperor Chuai's son. And then she went on her conquest and then came back three years later and then gave birth to him. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Yeah, and like that was like a big story for some reason, like the magical three year pregnancy (laughs) story. I don't have anything to say okay. about it. It's super, uh, super weird. Just super bizarre. Is a liar. Is there anything interesting about the child that was born? Like, did they become a war hero? Or do we know anything about that? Um, uh, he became like, the emperor. Uh, an emperor, okay. He did become the emperor. She gave birth after the three years to Homu Tawake. And she ruled from 203 to 269 CE. She died at age 100. So that's How did they die? I think just old age. Uh, this, she just uh, died of old age as an empress. I just would like to know if she had both her. Um... That is not true. Ching Shi died of old age too. Hmm? Oh, okay. Uh, okay. That's not true. Okay. Yeah, not disease and sickness. Yeah. Long life. Yeah. Fucking long. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's a long time. Good. Especially at the time. For uh, sure. Um, but yeah, so she died and then her son became the emperor. And she was, like, the one that kind of made it mainstream to be known as a geisha and made it a lot more acceptable in the imperial courts. Obviously, she was the empress, you know, so big deal. She, that got a lot of exposure. She was empress for, like, 66 years, too. So that's quite a reign. Yeah. And then her son became emperor, so the line remained unbroken. She was just kind of the one that brought it to the forefront. And she, so it's said that her conquest of Korea, she spilled no blood. So she, was that, like, um, just, like, pressure from, like, power of force, or was it, like, diplomacy, or... I don't know, like I said, everything was super sketchy. Like, okay. her stuff was just super weird and all over the place. Records were spotty at the time. Very spotty. So, I don't know, but it's said that she led a three-year conquest of the Korean Peninsula, probably. Like, it's not even certain where it was. It just says the promised land, probably the Korean Peninsula, you know? So. Yeah, I don't know. Okay. We're just kind of taking what we got and rolling with it there. Yeah, just a little bit. <laughs> so after Empress Jingyu became a prominent war badass and leader of a nation, the Onobu Geisha were boosted up and became, like, way more popular. Like I said, they were kind of at the forefront now. Um, and then about 900 years later, there was a national civil war between the Taira and Minamoto clans, and it would have been the late Heian period in Japan. So, just, you know, okay. late 12th century. Wow. 1180s. Okay. <clears throat> um, so this war was called the Genpei War. And it went from 1180 to 1185. And the next woman we're going to be discussing is Tomoe Gozen. Who I imagine was part of that war. Yeah, she was a big okay. part of the war. Okay, a leader, geisha leader. Yeah. Kind of the geisha leader. So Gozen is not actually a last name. It's actually a title of respect given to samurai. 
So two of the women we talked about today have that as, as their last name. All right. <clears throat> um, she was known for her bravery and incredible sword mistressry. And she was a huge part of the Gente War, like Bar said. Um, in 1182, in the Battle of Awazu, she led 300 Minamoto clansmen or samurai and samurai against two to 6,000 Taira warriors. How did that fight end? She was one of five to live. And did they win that battle or did they Oh, they lost. <laughs> they certainly <laughs> lost. <laughs> um, but two years later, she actually ended up defeating the most prominent enemy warrior, Honda no Moroshige. And she definitely cut his head off and rode around with, with it for a while, like for the rest of the battle. Oh, that's awesome. She like awesome. went and that presented awesome. it to her commander. Good intimidation. Mm -hmm. Definitely. That was a big thing, because then you can't bury the body and the head together, so you're, like, desecrated forever. Um, so, apparently, in the battle, her lord was mortally wounded, and either to try and save her life and have her be able to kind of continue his legacy, or because he felt shame dying with a woman by his side, he told her to flee. And she just flat out refused and laid in wait near him so that he could witness her fight a worthy opponent before he died. Uh, so then, Moroshige, famous for his strength, appeared surrounded by 30 other men, and she charged straight through them to him and grabbed his head as she rode by and slammed it onto the pommel of her saddle and then jerked it and sliced it off and then oh, just wow. carried it around with her and held it up for her commander to see. Quite brutal. Call that a uh, natural twenty. I'm the attack roll. <laughs> yeah. Wow. That is. It's so intimidating to see. That's a crazy Like your revered <laughs> dude just go out like that. Like oh shit. So right, we're, we're done for. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Ah, fall back, boys. So it was really unclear about this, but at some point during her reign as an Onobugeisha, she became Japan's first ever true general. Oh, wow. So, somewhere between leading the 300 and being one of five to survive and going into this battle, she became the first general that Japan had ever really had. Very cool. Yeah, definitely crazy. Um, what's even crazier, though, is that there is no record of what happened to her after that battle. So, there's like a whole bunch of different things that could have happened. So, she could have continued to fight just bravely until her death. Uh, she might have left and started a school teaching Kanto Jutsu and then the use of the Naginata. And then she also could have ridden off with another samurai and they got married. And then when he died, she became a nun and died at the oh, age wow. of 94. That one was like really specific. So that's the one I went with. Like kind of a Christian nun? That, that is pretty uh, specific. I, I don't know. I didn't think Christianity was around in Japan at this time. So I don't really know, but that's pretty specific. Uh, something about yeah. that. Yeah. Um, she also may have just ridden off with Moroshige's head and laid low until her death. Crazy. Riding off into the sunset with yeah. her head. As a winner. As a winner. As <laughs> a fucking winner. Uh, so I have a little snippet from an epic written at the beginning of the 14th century about Tomoe. You guys want to hear it? Sure. Just a little snippet. <laughs> What's an epic and it's on this tiny piece of paper? Sorry. I just have to hear something about this episode. I like this one at all. Here is our snippet. Tomoe was especially beautiful with white skin, long hair, and charming features. She was also a remarkably strong archer, and as a swordsman, she was a warrior worth 1,000, ready to confront demon or a god mounted on or on foot. She handled unbroken horses with superb skill. She rode unscathed down perilous descents. Whenever a battle was imminent, Yoshinaka sent her out as his first captain, equipped with strong armor, an oversized sword, and a mighty bow, and she performed more deeds of valor than any of his other warriors. No, uh, where did we get that snippet from? It's an epic written in the 14th century. Worth a thousand what? It literally just says worth a thousand. 
Probably worth a thousand warriors, because it says he was a warrior worth one thousand. Oh, okay, warriors. yeah, so that's, yeah. Almost a living val Valkyrie. Yeah. So that's written like 200 years after her. So they uh, have well a so legendary uh, status. She was, yeah, Very definitely so. legendary. Dark. Like the samurai were for sure legendary, and the Onomugosha very much so were as well for a long time. But just the fact that this particular individual, you know, we know the samurai. Yeah. So can, um, we're learning about the. Onobugeisha. So, because of that, like, it's interesting that this particular individual, we, we know their name. Yeah. And, yeah. So, it's actually an epic written about um, the amazing feats of samurai, and she's included in it. Very cool. Yeah. Very cool, yeah. It is. Yeah, it is. Dente War ultimately ended with the Minamoto going, gaining control and establishing the Kamakura Shogunate under Minamoto no Yoritomo in 1196. So how did that affect uh, Japan at the time? So they had a new shogunate in charge of the region. So ruling over pretty much everything. They were like, yeah, like they're like the main ruling force, but there's all still, the other clans are still like in charge of themselves. So like, I imagine the conflict between different tribes were It like, definitely persisted. And uh, because of that, maybe the said tribes would maybe unite against the shogunate or maybe he would just clear out spaces and mostly they would battle to become the next shogunate like so it was more like um they were in charge for now until the power got taken away by someone else okay totally. and then they would be in charge until someone else took the power like and it was just kind of whichever clan got the strongest and the smartest the fastest and took them down and like yeah. they, yeah, they took a really long time to unite Japan. Um, so this leads us to our third woman, Hang, Hang, Hangaku Itazaki or Gozen. So Itazaki would have been her given name, and then Gozen obviously is the prestigious respect title for samurai. So because she has this title, that must mean that she is another warrior. Yeah, she's, she's a really cool warrior. Right. Yeah. On a bugeisha. Uh, she was also very beautiful and skilled as a warrior, but she was more known for her archery and skill shooting from a horse than her swordsmanship, like Tomoe. Uh, but she was also good with the Naginata. Like, they all, they were all good at all of it, you know what I mean? But it was just like, Tomoe was like famous for her incredible sword mistressry. Hangaku was like really good with a bow, like exceptionally skilled. Like Sharp we talked shooter. about, they had the giant bow. So bow. She was really well known for doing that exceptionally well. Uh, so she was born into a prestigious warrior family, the Jo family, and they had blood ties with the Taira clan, who had much political power and influence. So the Taira are who Tomoe was fighting against. She was leading the Nemoto men. Um, so due to her intelligence and battle prowess, at a young age, she was given the same educations as her brother and nephew who she grew up with. And she was even in charge of palace affairs when her father and brothers were away. Oh, wow. Uh, by her early 20s, she was actually the... Um, like she was in charge of her nephew. She was his provider, caretaker. What would you call it? Guardian. Ah, uh, okay. Yes, okay. Was that because somebody had died? Or is that I, just like something that was I don't know, it was, was kind of just of the... like a weird thing. Okay. Like, it just was, it's like, yeah, she was in charge of her nephew because she was so badass. Um, what, did you have to fucking, fucking shoot this bow? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, fuck people up. But yeah, so in her early 20s, she was his guardian as well as leading forces. And the ruling force was not favoring them, so they had to work twice as hard to get any success, you know, because they had less troops and they weren't in charge of things. So her successes in battles and, like, with leading the men contributed to the Joe family legacy and their military might, which was already pretty impressive. 
And then in 1201, the government was in ter turmoil, and Nagamochi, which was like her lord, possibly father, probably father, her lord, definitely. Um, he had been captured and forced to swear loyalty to the Minamoto, and he tried to overthrow the Kamakura shogunate because he was like sick of them being in charge and he wanted, he wanted power again back to his clan. And he had been like forced to swear loyalty to them, so that like pissed him off too. They had kept him captive for like three years. Um, so this was called the Kenin Uprising, and there was a siege on the Toyosakayama fort, and Hangaku led 3,000 samurai to defend it against 10,000 men, <laughs> which were led by Nagamochi's captor. So another martyr. Yeah. Their fort ended up getting breached, like, clearly. And Hangaku was injured. She got shot in the leg on her horse. So she was injured, and it was not looking good. Their fort was breached. And then she collapsed. But before she collapsed, there was a bunch of samurai that had, like, lined up in front of her from the enemy forces. And they had been so impressed by her ferocity in battle that they were begging her permission to propose to her. Holy shit, okay. Oh, wow. Yeah. So... That's, that's crazy. It's fucking nuts. It's pretty badass. So, she then collapsed and then got captured. And then she was taken to Kamakura, which was like a large hub at the time, but it's like a pretty small little city now. And then she got presented to their shogun, Miramoto no Yorie, and he introduced her to Asari Yoshito, who was a great uh, warrior for their people. And Asari was like super impressed with her and loved her on sight, so he asked the shogun permission to get married, and so he married them. And then they just like got married and went and lived in Kai and had a little daughter. So after, well, here's a, I got, I have a question. So mm -hmm. because she married the enemy, how did that affect the town, the city she was defending? Like, did it basically get sacked and she um, basically sided with the enemy and um, fucking married them? Like, uh, so... The way it works with the samurai is super interesting, actually, and I had my sister confirm this, and I, like, looked into it, but when a samurai or an onobugeisha get married, they just aren't that anymore. Like, they're just married now, and it's for the men and the women. Like, it's not a gendered thing. It's just, like, once you're married, it's, so it's kind of like a sacrifice thing from the, the country itself. Like, your army is giving up its warriors in the hopes of getting new warriors from them. So they, you like, sacrifice them so that they can raise a child and teach them their ways of battle and kind of, like, raise the new generation of warriors. And whether it was samurai... Samurai or Onobugeisha. They would put up the sword. Just, yeah. Oh, when they, when they were married. Mm -hmm. And this wasn't whether or not it was to one another in that class. It would be like if they got married to anyone. Yeah. Yeah, just to anyone. So anyone. it didn't matter who they married. And it, like I said, it was like if a so the samurai found a common woman that he just like fell in love with. And they married. And they married. He, he would, would not be a samurai anymore. Wow. So, okay. In order to foster like warriors. For yeah. The next generations, the greater good of like longevity of the greater good. Well, and a lot of the time they would start or become part of a, t a school that taught those skills, you know. So they would be passing on their skill set in multiple ways, and then um, they would like teach their children, obviously. And it, uh, yeah, they just they hung up the blade, except. For, so the Anabugeisha, when they got married, they had to bring their Nandinata into their husband's house. And they weren't allowed to, like, use it as... If they were attacked, they were allowed to use their weapons. They still carried it at all times. Right. No, the, that's the kaiken. That's the that's little blade. Okay. So the no, big no, no, no. sword they okay. had to bring into their husband's house. And they used it daily as 
as a spiritual practice. So it became more like a meditative thing, more like Tai Chi. Yeah. But they would keep up the Tanto Jitsu and they would keep up the um, Naginata practice in more of like a yoga sense or sure, something it was like an like, exercise like yeah it was like exercising or like keeping their skills sharp still to be protectors because they still were like they would have been like last resort protectors of the village still sure so like if there was a battle if, and the yeah, if there was town like a got siege invaded on the town sure. suddenly they would definitely be there to protect last line of defense for the village yeah or whatever. but they weren't like sure taking part in battle anymore they weren't involved in like the courts as much anymore you know the less really, of a soldier yeah really the farthest they would go is being a battle advisor which i imagine was also very useful because with all those years of the training before they would get married it would be like well they're you know studied they have all this teaching and not mm -hmm. not just the combat and swordsmanship and things like that but studies so like that would be an ideal advisor of the, like, you know, class that they were in. Well, and Tomoe, the last one we talked about, was known as, like, a tactical genius. Like, she was known to be incredibly skilled at, like, guiding men on the battlefield and leading troops. So, hence why she became the first general. So, all sorts of schools started opening when things settled governmentally after this. And they were specifically to train new Onabugeisha and to teach others the art of Tanto Jutsu and the Naginata. So they were just like popping up everywhere. Like it was becoming a big thing, you know? Mm -hmm. So the role of the Onabugeisha and their presence was just getting bigger and bigger in the centuries after Tomoe and Hangaku until almost every single village had a group of Onabugeisha who would go out in small groups on stealth missions. And this went on until like the 1800s, like mid 1800s. So it's a range from like 900 BCE to 1800 and like 60 something BCE. Fuck yeah. Yeah. That's so long. That's it's such very a long cool. It, it, the idea of ghost fighters, almost in a sense, that they're like, trained and know how to fight and they'll go out on these little um stealth missions, stealth missions. Yeah. yeah but then also they like it's because at the time you had said that like it was more like they were a last line of defense so they wouldn't you know they'd be living in their city and you know being part of the community but then also they'd have this uh skill and job like that was you know maybe many people like didn't even know yeah um or i guess that's not true because it was a well-respected title and they were elite but um i think it is cool that they would just be this you know sometimes presence. we'll go out yeah presidents will go out on these like missions fucking yeah do some commando shit maybe i don't know but and uh they were recognized for like what they were doing for it uh you know the people in their villages and stuff so that's fucking really cool um yeah hell yeah it was like a prestigious thing to be an honor like, so people would period. know so it wouldn't exactly yeah, you be like known. a mystery and it wasn't exactly sure like, okay yeah so they would have been like living in part of the community but they would have been like a known group of women okay i got like, you yeah well maybe not by their enemies well, not yeah, not by the end of the That's where you get like what you're saying, like the young man kind of becomes warrior. Like you, you still have that shroud of uh, anonymity because of well, your enemy doesn't know you, your community doesn't, so they have that kind of like last line of defense, like you were saying. Oh yeah, yeah that's what, I love that you say that. That's very fucking cool. That like it could be used as this is a married housewife, and you think this is someone that doesn't know, and then out of nowhere. Well, yeah, they're going to warrior savior. Face to face yeah. with a warrior, yeah. Off guard. And, and that's the, I mean. The, the, the element of the surprise. Element. So, yeah, I mean, they use that against any enemy you can get. They just think that this, they're not ready to battle. And you, and you obviously are. So, yeah. your your first quick reaction could be just the end of it right away. Well, Fuck yeah. And also, these women would have been training in their specific regions from, like, childhood, basically. And so they would be able to like walk the terrain and hide in the forests and the landscape Just really well. Just advantage right there. And what yeah. their their biggest thing was, they would go out in like small groups of women and like like sneak attack people that were trying to invade or. So almost guerrilla warfare. 
Yeah, yeah. On a much, yeah, on a small scale. Sure, yeah. You're on a small scale, right? You're right. Well, but on both ends, like the attacking armies also would be small, not like. Wouldn't charge up against ten thousand. No, I mean, that's some insane. of the, some of, <laughs> I guess, <laughs> we have heard that some of that things like that happened. I guess not ten thousand, but a thousand. No, yeah, ten thousand. Yeah. She oh. took three thousand against ten thousand, and then the other woman took. There was records of either six. Three or two thousand that she took three hundred up again. But that wasn't a regular thing. That was more of a like this is a circumstance of like yeah why yeah. She kept that legend and right. stats. It was like a right circumstance of war. Years later, an embellishment came to come to power. Yeah. Very true. So I guess a fleet at the time in Japan would have been three thousand men, and then there are accounts of one fleet or two fleets that they went up against, so it was either three or six thousand, realistically. Yeah. So, fucking army, yeah, for sure. So, at this point, mid-1800s, the ruling Tokugawa clan and the imperial courts are in a, were in a time of unrest. The courts had created the SEAL Team 6 of Onibugeisha, basically, and they called them the Joshitai. Uh, their leader was the 21-year-old Onibugeisha named Nakano Tateko. She was obviously extremely skilled in battle, as well as commanding people as a general. She led the Joshitai in the Battle of Aizu, where her and her women fought valiantly alongside an army of samurai, but sadly, she was shot through the heart on the battlefield and died. No way to go out. She used her dying breath to ask her sister to behead her so that an enemy couldn't take her head as a prize. Oh, damn. Or her body as a prize. Fucking fighting side by side with the Take her life either. Yeah. Well, no, she was shot through the heart. She, like, with an arrow. She died, but that's not going to be. I think that totally was. It was. It was the end cause of death. Oh, okay. So she did die and so then she, was beheaded? Yeah, she, had, she used her dying breath to ask her sister to behead her and take the head. Mm. So her sister cut her head off and then took the head. And um, she buried it under a pine tree at the Aizo Bangemachi Temple, where a monument to Nakano still stands today. Nice. Now, talking about that, the whole decapitation thing... Um, I don't know if this exactly is uh, Japanese culture or history, but I feel like I have heard somewhere that at the time, in the, you know, more feudal ages, that... This is taking... 1800. Oh, okay. Um, well, well, still, re- regardless. It, it is feudal, but this is like the end of the... Fe- like, this battle is the end of feudalism in Japan. Oh. So you're right. No, no, that's fine. I was just going to say, it reminds me, I feel like I've heard somewhere, and I don't know if it is Japan, but I've heard that, like, it was common for the uh, elite generals, captains of armies, and things like that, that the collection of heads would be common to be taken, not only for, like, showing that you defeated this, um, you know, prestigious prestigious warrior, warrior, yeah, but also that you would be paid for, um, you would, you would be compensated like a bounty, almost. Uh, almost, almost like mercenary work. Okay. Except you were not a mercenary; you were with the army. But, um, and this isn't the first time that has been brought up in this episode that you had mentioned that the, you know, decapitation had happened. So, um, just kind of, I, I know that's a little off topic. It just no, reminded no. me of that. Um, you know. Um, so, um, it wasn't a bounty thing. Decapitation. So, having it done by an ally to yourself was so that you couldn't be a prize or a trophy for the other for the enemy definitely and then decapitating the enemy was because that was desecrating their body because you took the head and you kept it and you showed it off as a trophy and you had a trophy and then also their body was buried separately which is like a big deal so because when they're buried it was common that you needed the whole body together yeah, that's like, so their bodies were buried separately when they got decapitated by the enemy, so that's why that was such a big deal. I see. As well as keeping 
yourself with the ally. Okay. So, Nakano is actually thought of as the last great Onabugeisha, and the Battle of Aizu was the last stand of the Onabugeisha. Okay. So this was the fall of a, an era. Yeah. Yeah. So after this battle, the shogunate and the feudal Japanese military government fell and left the imperial courts in charge with a 15 year old emperor on the throne. That sounds sound and steady. Yeah, right. I'm sure, things went great. <laughs> Happens all the time. <laughs> yeah. So. After this time, the image of the female samurai was just slowly erased by the rest of the world, not actually by Japan. Um, so the rest of us kind of just solidified in our own minds a picture of a samurai as a big, stocky, muscular man. And we never, we also solidified the image of the woman as docile, stay at home, subservient to the men in Japan. So it was really our own like perceptions that erased the Onabugeisha and made them like less of a legacy. Wow. Very intense though. Intense like kind of nuts how little is actually written about all the, the warriors considering how high status they were and how prestigious it was. I'm glad you said that. I had I had totally spaced that, but I was going to say that, you know, every everybody, you know, I, I don't like Broadly, but yeah. a, a, so many people know of the samurai. Yeah. You know, but this is just as a uh, level of uh, uh, status and the same type of like, warrior. And uh, I just think it's interesting that, like, I definitely have not heard of the. Oh, no, yeah, I mean, it, it is crazy because they have the like, historical significance. Very much so. Well, yeah. yeah we don't hear about it. It's just kind of overshadowed. Yeah, yeah, erased. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And that was our own cultures do cultures doing. But maybe in Japan, like these are, this is well, just like fucking standard knowledge, like that people might know. I'm actually not too sure how well known they are in Japan today. Like, oh, okay. I know they persisted a lot longer. Their legends and stuff, and I'm sure they're still spoken about more so. But it might be more in like. Like fairy tale songs is what I was thinking. Sure. Like, you know what I mean? How like little kids will learn stories that like were once kind of common knowledge of things that have been fairy taleized. I mean, it's almost like a Johnny had uh, made a, a different reference, but I was thinking of King Arthur, but uh, like okay. the legendary warrior. Um, you had mentioned somebody else. I don't really remember, but. Um, yeah, it's kind of like that, like, um, elaborated story arc of, like, they did so well that by word of mouth and time, the, you know, idea and the influence that they had just, like, expanded because they were so, you know, uh, prominent and uh, praised uh, that they... You know, uh, were rec stood the test of time and became were so living important. legends. Living legends, yeah, exactly. Um, fucking a. Yeah, I mean that is that is pretty badass. Definitely. What are you looking at? Kind of, almost like a yeah. I, I I definitely think I said it earlier, but like a Valkyrie, or just yeah. a yeah, like. Yeah, totally. It's like hearing epic. That's cool. You you uh mentioned Seal Team Six. That's cool. <laughs> yeah, I like that. That was yeah, cool. The elite. Yeah, they fuck they yeah. were. They were like the top Defenders. cream of the crop of the Onabugeisha that were made into this team for the Imperial Force. They're fighting. Yeah. With tenacity. They lost, yeah. but With tenacity. They lost tenaciously. I'm well. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in, y'all. Have a good night. Thanks for listening. If you guys enjoyed that, tell your friends. 
or give us a follow on social media. We are Tenacious V's podcast pretty much everywhere. You can listen on Podbean, YouTube, and Spotify. And these episodes are brought to you by Nona, Will, and Johnny. And the music is done by Staple Milk. Come back next time for some more historical heroines.